Paving the way. Jeffrey Epstein grand jury files to be revealed. Why was Jeffrey Epstein given such grace and mercy for his humane, inhumane crimes? Decades later, what and who will be outed? So we can see what happened and why. A young woman who endured his sex trafficking and the senator who steered the bill right here live. <laughs> Descent into chaos. A Haitian bishop healing, recovering in South Florida. Was he targeted? Bringing attention to the to the political paralysis that uh, is keeping Haiti on the on the doorsteps of hell. Secret agent man takes a plea. It's it's classic trade crafts for espionage. What's next for the U.S. ambassador turned agent for Cuba? <laughs> Justice delayed, now justice suspended. George Barahona ruled incompetent. George Barahona is the worst of the worst. After 13 years, what now? The big news of the week and the newsmakers all live this week in South Florida. Good Sunday morning. Welcome. I'm Glenna Milberg and only in South Florida kind of run down this next hour and we begin with a brand new law the governor signed late this week that paves the way to open the decades old grand jury investigation that led to an initial deal for Jeffrey Epstein to avoid the consequences of child sex trafficking. A decade later, after a Miami Herald expose, New York federal prosecutors did what South Florida's would not indict the now deceased billionaire financier for the network of rape and abuse that victimized and traumatized hundreds of young girls. One of them, now a woman, is here today. Haley Robson was in high school in West Palm when she was unwittingly recruited into Epstein's criminal enterprise two decades ago. And watch this week as the governor signed that law that may lead to some answers. Haley, it is great to have you on the program. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me today. So we watched you watch the governor sign that bill. You were with uh, Jenna Lisa Jones, another young woman standing there with you. What, what was going through your mind at that moment? I, I'm, I was totally nervous <laughs> standing next to the governor, obviously. Um, I, I mean, there was a lot of things that went through my mind, um, mostly just how long we've waited for this moment and just um, how I've prayed for this moment. And I've tried to manifest that moment for change um, just to expose all the corruption that I think everybody um, involved and not involved knows that occurred during his plea bargain. You know, the, uh, if somebody is not following this case, I mean, it's been 20 years. And there's so many twists and turns. The, the initial plea bargain was in Palm Beach, where you are right now. Um, you know, we've heard since then, since the Miami Herald, uh, years later, literally focused on it and unearthed so much more that eventually led to the New York charges. You know, you and, and so many other now young women who endured so much have, I mean, you're so brave, so courageous for going public and being public. Do, do you really think this eventually, when we see what's in those files, will this be closure for you? I definitely think it's going to give me a lot more closure than what I expected or that I was even hoping for. Um, you know, there's, like I said, my journey was a lot different from some of the other victims. And I think that I was definitely categorized in some, um, I was categorized in some places I, I didn't belong. And I've known all along that there's been corruption. I know this plea deal does not make sense. I definitely know there were hands in the pot in making this plea bargain successful. And, you know, I'm just really thankful that the governor has stepped up and the legislature, um, Tina and Joe worked really hard, both senators. I mean, I, I can't even express my gratitude, but I, I definitely think this is not gonna just give me closure. I think it's gonna present closure for all the victims that, you know, decided to stay private, decided not to speak out and for good reason. Um, and I'm just really excited to finally have this last missing piece of the puzzle um, exposed so I can actually move on with my life and finally say, OK, I understand what happened. I understand what went wrong. L let me ask you, do you because that grand jury investigation resulted in literally a, a charge of, of prostitute soliciting a prostitute, um, not child sex trafficking. Uh, he went to jail for, you know, however long, not very long work release where 13 he was months. 13 months, went out and got out and went to work every day. 
Um, and all the while, this, this grand jury, do you, if this grand jury was not given the kind of evidence, if they did not see people like you and, and the victims, and the witnesses, and they were kind of slow walked on purpose, which is what many people believe, what, what are those records even going to show, do you think? I don't think it's so much about what the records are going to show us. I think it's going to be what the records are not showing us. Yeah. Um, like you just stated yourself, um, I think there was a lack of information that was presented to the grand jury, and I think it was extremely deliberate. Um, I definitely think that was part of the corruption. So it's just going to be interesting for everything to come out and for everybody to finally see um, who was involved in the lack of or the non-information that was given to the grand jury. For sure. There were, to your point, a lot of people who knew about this sex trafficking network, who knew that Jeffrey Epstein was not only raping, using girls to service himself and, and how many others we don't know yet. Um, and you were part of that kind of unwittingly and also recruiting other people. And so there were so many people that knew about this and yet here you were not believed for a long time. Yeah, that's that part. Um, it definitely it definitely hits me in the heart. Um, I, I, I think that there's um, there was a lack of, like I said, information that was being handled. I think the whole case from the very beginning was mishandled. I was mishandled. All the victims at one way or another were mishandled. Um, a lot of misrepresentation as well. Um, it's definitely difficult because I've been on both sides. I was sexually abused by Jeffrey Epstein. Um, and then I was also uh, persuaded to uh, bring other girls to him, which in all fairness was a part of the abuse. We all did it. So I think, like I said, I think it's, it's definitely a long time coming. I definitely think this is gonna be vindication for specifically me, what's gonna be or not be in those documents. I have always felt like I was partially targeted, um, which is why I wasn't given the same plea deal that some of the other women um, were given. And I definitely think that's something that I've known for a very long time. And when I say I've known that for a very long time, I mean, it is a gut intuition. It is in my heart. There's just some things that I just, I have an intuition about. And I feel like this is going to be so groundbreaking for sure. Absolutely. And um, you know, eventually, Maybe, and I, the governor talked a little bit about this, maybe the New York grand jury files might somehow be made public. And, and I think then the public will really learn a lot more. What, what, is, what is next for Haley Robson? I've been advocating against uh, human trafficking and sex tra trafficking for at least um, maybe five years. I've worked with multiple um, nonprofits, uh, Human Trafficking Coalition of South Florida. I've done tons of speaking arrangements. You know, for me, it's just continuing my journey of healing um, to keep speaking out against it, to keep telling my story, hopefully inspiring other young women who may find themselves in similar situations um, on how to handle not necessarily the abuse because that's more of a therapist you're going to have to deal and cope with a therapist in order to find your healing but more so how to get your life back on track i think a lot of people that deal with trauma on such a significant level they tend to get down on themselves and forget that there's a beautiful journey to healing it is a tough journey but there is such great opportunity and your life doesn't have to be destroyed or damaged because of the trauma that you go through or that you endure. There is a success story for everybody out there. And I think what inspires me are people like Lisa Bryant, um, the governor, just uh, really sticking it out there and, and helping us get this passed. Um, Joseph Abruzzo, who I met, who was just amazing. We, we actually um, are going to be you know, talking about all of that with uh, Senator Tina Polsky, who is going to join us next about that whole end of the story. Haley, you have been showing such courage. You're so brave, and now you're such a role model. And I just, I'm so grateful you took the time to be with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I really do appreciate your time. Thank you. All right, up next, um, what that law may or maybe may not accomplish. 
the South Florida state senator who worked to get that grand jury records open. She is here with us next. The bills are called Disclosure of Grand Jury Testimony. That became among the first laws for the governor would sign this legislative session. It was carried on the Senate side by State Senator Tina Polsky, Democrat repping North Broward and South Palm Beach counties, right here for a kind of behind the scenes look at getting that done. Senator Polsky, welcome. Hi, Glenna, good to see you again. Thank you, same. So this is actually the second time you tried with that bill. Last session, it didn't move quite that quickly, didn't get anywhere. What do you think was different this time? Um, I'm not really sure. You know, sometimes legislation does take a little time to percolate and let people get used to it. It is a bit of a radical idea because grand jury testimony is sacredly secret. And so what we did was actually three years ago kind of floated the idea as an amendment just to get people adjusted to it and then withdrew the amendment just so I could speak on it on the floor. Then next year, last year, we had the strategy, you know, going forward as a full bill proposal from the beginning of session. And I think I may have had a hearing or two in the Senate, but it didn't go anywhere in the House. Um, so this year, you know, was the year. And sometimes it's just a matter of time. The other thing is maybe now the governor just paid attention to it. He mentioned it on the campaign trail when he was running for president. So maybe it's something that just piqued his interest and it got through uh, the three Senate committees and the three House committees and the floors of both pretty quickly. And then obviously he, you know, while we're still in session, flew down to Palm Beach and signed the legislation there. I was thinking that, especially in the last two sessions, there's been such a focus on protecting children and there can be no better way to protect children from child sex trafficking than a, a, attaching yourself to outing what might have gone into the Jeffrey Epstein cover-up for so long. There's uh, the Palm Beach County Clerk of Court, Joseph Abruzzo. Um, a, li a little bit of a shout out to him because I think he's the unsung hero that really kind of raised the question, why can't I release these Absolutely. records? Yeah. yeah. Um, he, and so was, was he like sort of the idea behind a lot of oh, this? Oh, 100%. I mean, you know, we get ideas from all over, but this was his issue. He wanted to be able to release the records and he was not legally able to do so. So what can you do but change legislation? And then you're faced with the issue of, well, how do we make this one case grant of grand jury testimony public, but keep all the other grand jury testimony secret? Because you can't allow grand jury testimony to be exposed in general. You know, it's meant to be secret for a reason. And so we had to come up with the most narrowly tailored uh, piece of legislation that we could that when you look at it in total only applies to Jeffrey Epstein. Um, and I wanna clarify something that I believe the governor said during the press conference of signing. He thought maybe it could be used for cases against the Catholic church and, and child sex abuse. I don't believe that's the case with this legislation that we passed. I think this legislation only pertains to Jeffrey Epstein and it's obviously not hard to be on the side of right on this case. And, you know, shout out to Haley. What a great job she did earlier in your show. And I'm, you know, so proud of the work she's doing and putting herself out there. She's really yeah. um, such a hero. Um, so as long as you're mentioning the bill, let's get in a little bit in the weeds with this a bit. Um, I think we have a graphic so that people can actually see some of the components of the bill, to your point, that makes it very specific to the Jeffrey Epstein grand jury case. Um, so a couple of the components is the subject, which would be Epstein in this case, has to be deceased, which he is. Um, they're thinking suicide in jail just uh, not long after he went there. But uh, I think that the, technically the jury's still out on that. But anyway, um, mm -hmm. so the victims have to be minors. And then the testimony has to have been ordered, disclosed by a court. So th those are pretty specific to your point to this particular case, but but why wouldn't that be applicable to, well, to something like the Catholic sex abuse case, which is decades old and many of the priests involved are deceased and the victims are minors? Why, why not? Well, it depends on a particular case. You know, it could just be all the cases, but if there was an yeah. individual case in the state of Florida um, where maybe you could make a case for this, I don't know that any of that has ever been ordered to be disclosed. Uh, you know, what makes this one unique is that, and what made uh, Joseph Abruzzo, the clerk of Palm Beach County, 
uh, courts want to release it is that a judge said, I would release this, but I can't because the law does not allow. It would require an act of the legislature to allow the judge to disclose it. So all of those issues combined created, you know, kind of this perfect storm of being able to pass this legislation and have it only apply to Jeffrey Epstein. You know, that's not to say if there was a particular case that we couldn't come back and make a similar exception. We just have to be very careful. Uh, and one of the things we were worried about when we were presenting this legislation and why we had to tread carefully is we have to keep the sanctity of grand jury testimony as is and secret. Otherwise, it's um, it wouldn't work. Right. So, it, would see, it would cease to make the grand jury what the grand jury is. Correct. And, yeah. and to expose, you know, the people who sit on the grand jury and the yeah. prosecutors and the witnesses. Um, so we have to be very, very careful. And, you know, we weren't sure that this piece of legislation would make it through because it is kind of flying in the face of one of our um, absolute uh, touchstones of American jurisprudence. Um, so but we were able to do it because it was so narrow. So I believe it only applies to Epstein if it turns out that there's another case that we might want to, to look into, then we'll have to look at that. But, you know, I don't know that <clears throat> some of the the Catholic Church has not been properly prosecuted because of a grand jury kind of mistake that we believe happened in this case or a prosecutorial mistake that they didn't take all the grand jury information and charge correctly. Yeah. So I don't know an individual case where that might be uh, in another circumstance. So we'd have to look at that. But, you know, if something came before me, I would certainly consider it. But, you know, within the bounds of what you know, yeah. we'd like to yeah. keep our American jurisprudence what it is. Let, let me ask you this. You know, Jeffrey Epstein was, was so wealthy and so well connected socially, politically. Um, you know, little doubt that's the reason that so many helped him escape initially the full weight of what he had done. Do you think seeing some of these records might uh, precipitate some more dominoes falling? Should should there be people worried right now? Uh, there probably should be, because if it's discovered that there are other people who should be charged, um, I believe with our laws with, with child uh, abuse or rape, that there's no statute of limitations. Um, if the person, you know, wants to come forward much later in life, so I think this could really open up. Um, you know, we also might see, unfortunately, you know, malfeasance on the part of how he was prosecuted. I think that's a lot of what we're getting at. You know, none of those players are still in office anymore. So that's another reason why we felt we were able to get this, you know, very narrow exception. So, um, you know, different sheriffs, different prosecutors. Yeah. But it's just something that has lingered for so long. And we want to give people like Haley and the other victims, you know, the the sunshine, the light that they deserve on what happened to their cases, because, you know, him having a plea deal for prostitution as opposed to actual child sex abuse and rape, as yeah. you know, the victims have said, that that's terrible. Yeah. That that's what he was able to get away with. And it's terrible stain on our justice system that they allow that to happen. Yeah. So July 1st, that law takes effect. So I guess stay tuned. <laughs> Tina Polsky, Senator from North Broward, South Palm Beach, and uh, one of the architects of this opening grand jury records for Jeffrey Epstein. Great to have you today. Thanks so much, Glenn. Have a great day. You too. Thanks. Right now, a Haitian bishop burned in an explosion is being treated in South Florida. The increasing violence there, the focus of colleagues and families here. Miami's Archbishop is with us live right here next. The escalating violence in Haiti, especially in Port-au-Prince, includes gang attacks on the airports, police stations there, images like these cut to the core in South Florida, especially for those with close connections. Bishop Pierre-André Dumas from just outside Port-au-Prince, he's been at Jackson Memorial this week recovering from burns from an explosion where he was staying there. Just after his airlift here, six brothers and a priest were kidnapped, the most recent religious and clergy to be targeted in gang aggression. Miami's Archbishop Thomas Wensky is in close contact. So many connections because of the years of work there and right here at the table with us today. Archbishop, great to have you. Thank, Thank you, you for coming Thank in. You for How is the bishop, first and foremost? Well, I saw him on Wednesday at the hospital and, and Jackson 
is probably the best burn care place in the United States, and they're taking very good care of him. He has uh, some relatives, a sister or brother that came down from Boston and, and New York to visit with him, and uh, the hospital's letting them go in one by one because they're very careful about uh, not exposing him to infection because, you know, the, the skin is the first defense of the body against any... 100% uh, burn and now, victims, and he, yes. he's, you know, got third degree burns, second degree burns, mm -hmm. first degree first degree burns and so, but I found him in very good spirits and uh, he was very grateful to be where he was and, and it took a, a while to get him out of Haiti. It took a couple of days uh, because uh, his passport was also burned in that explosion and so he had to get a new passport and a, a new visa from the United States. So he only got here last weekend. I remember we were tracking his, right, right. his journey there. And, and now he's, he's in the hospital for about a week and uh, uh, He's in the trauma intensive care, but uh, doing well. So we're very careful to say we don't know what that explosion is about yet, still under investigation, it's, but it's, it's, it's a, a big but, right? It's suspicious, and yeah. I asked the bishop what he thought, and he, you know, he was very noncommittal. He said he couldn't say it was uh, a, a, an accident or something uh, deliberate. But uh, the violence in Haiti recently, uh, in February, intensified because February 7th was the anniversary of the departure of Baby Doc. And so elections have been away, right? So long ago. So long ago, and so the elections in Haiti under their new constitution were always supposed to take place on February seventh, and so we had another February seventh come and go with no movement towards elections. There's not one elected official in Haiti right now, and the prime minister was elected by no one. He was appointed by the president two days before he was assassinated, but there was no parliament to confirm him, and. Uh, and, and so uh, he went off this week to uh, Kenya to sign an accord with the Kenyan government for uh, police officers to come over to help out Haiti. And this is something that's been being talked about for over a year. The Supreme Court of Kenya has stopped it because there was no reciprocal agreement. So he went to Kenya to sign a reciprocal agreement. He also stopped and in the Caribbean, in the Caracom, in Guyana, I believe. I was going to ask you about and, that. But, and, but the, the problem is is that uh, uh, the gangs attacked the airport on Thursday. Right. And the reason yeah. they attacked the airport on Thursday was to make sure that the, pres the prime minister couldn't get back. And so... Uh, so the, the gangs are in full control, um, petrifying to people. But what I want to ask you very specifically for, for our purposes of our conversation here is the, the really focused attacks on clergy there, and Bishop Dumas was was a kind of a critic of this situation. Well, uh, Bishop Dumas is the vice president of the Bishops' Conference of Haiti, and, and he has been trying to play a role of, as a mediator between uh, several civil society groups that have been uh, uh, working or demanding elections. And, uh, and, and so uh, earlier in February, you know, he was asking his uh, people in his diocese to ring the church bells at noon and to pray for a a solution to this uh, impasse, so that the uh, he thinks that the prime minister should go, in order to make uh, make possible a solution. So, uh, you know, so that's why there's so much suspicion because he went to uh, Port-au-Prince. He's from the diocese of Ansabo Miraguan, and the south western part of of uh, Haiti. He went to Port-au-Prince, had mass in the morning at one of the uh, churches in Port-au-Prince, and then in the evening he went to a place where he usually stays when he's in Port-au-Prince, and this explosion happened. Where and he was staying. Where he was staying, and and he was there also to participate in some of those, uh, you know, dialogue groups or, you know, talks to yeah. move the thing forward. Uh, last night uh, in Haiti, apparently the gangs and attacked the penitentiary, and so a lot of the prisoners uh, were set free. And you know, we, we have not really heard that yet. You are breaking news here yeah, well, with us today. I was talking yeah. to a, a couple of uh, uh, priest friends of mine in Haiti through WhatsApp. They or, opened the, the jails and well, let had, the it, criminals well, out? Well, you know, not, not everybody in jail necessarily is a criminal. Okay, as, as point, a, point well taken, as, fair as, point. As, especially in Haiti and the conditions are very inhumane, but certainly uh, a lot of people 
uh, you know, uh, took off. And, yeah. and But, you know, in, in a sense, it's a misnomer to call these gangs, because when we think of gangs, we think of, like, juvenile delinquents. But these are these are well-organized and well-armed uh, Militia? Actors. Would that be a Mil Yeah, they're better? almost, they're almost a part of a, of a, of a, uh, uh, a pseudo-state. And, and I think they're very much, in, in many ways, very much connected with the, the cartels that are controlling so much of uh, Latin America, Venezuela, Colombia, So attempting Mexico. to become a de facto government. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And, 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 and earlier today I heard rumors of, you know, and it, you know, people attempting to, you know, to, to uh, overthrow the government, but as, you know, as, with no elected officials, it's hard to even speak right. about government. But. Let me, um, in the short time we have together, I want you, you know, there's so many connections here. You're mm -hmm. back and forth all, all the right. time. Um, so many of our Haitian community are devout Catholics. What, what do you and your priests in this diocese tell people locally? How do you minister to them about what's going on? Well, we always try to raise hope, you know. And, uh, you know, Haiti is like a, a house on fire. When a house is on fire, you know, your neighbor's house is on fire, you might give them refuge in your house, or you might even try to help them put out the fire. But uh, apparently what we've been trying to do is to lock the doors and have mm -hmm. the people stay in the fire. For example, in, in the, in the uh, three years that uh, President Biden has been in office, he's deported over 25,000 Haitians yeah. out of, from the United States back to Haiti. There was a flight that was supposed to be going on Thursday that didn't get to Haiti because of the airport being shut up. The, the immigration issue very much a right. part of this house on fire. Right. Archbishop Thomas Wensky, great to have you at the table. Appreciate you being here on a Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Cuba's secret agent man in Miami takes a plea. What does that mean for the decades of damage Manuel Rocha might have done? That's next. The arrest sent shockwaves through South Florida and had countless people rethinking past conversations. Manuel Rocha, the Miami-based U.S. diplomat who secretly used his position to support Cuba, we learned this week admitted his double life in return for a plea deal. The narrative of his arrest reads like a spy novel locally. The details of that plea still to come among those who called it. Emilio Gonzalez, who among a roster of public service roles with Miami and Miami-Dade County, headed up U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services with the Department of Homeland Security and was director of Western Hemisphere Affairs at the National Security Council. Uh, your, your CV and resume takes up this whole no, segment. No, no, no. That just means I'm old. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> just fine. Um, so you predicted the plea. You were sitting in that chair. You predicted this plea would happen. How did you know and what does it mean? The Department of Justice and the FBI will never go so far out on a limb to arrest a person of his caliber and his stature mm. unless they've got something. Um, and once that happens, then it's incumbent upon the individual to figure out what's the best way out. Um, interestingly, um, we were all surprised last week because what should have been a status hearing on the use of classified documents turned into a plea. This, this case surprises <coughs> over and over. But, but, but what you see is that the Department of Justice was willing to use classified material to take this to trial. And when that happens, all bets are off. So you think they were going to allow the classified material to be in the public Th that, court record? That was the intent of the meeting was to get the ground rules of, of classified documentation. Um, when they do that, they're not turning back. And when they've got 15 counts on you, they're going for the kill, uh, metaphorically. Um, so it's just a matter of time before you realize, you know, this is a losing battle. The, the United States government, all administrations take espionage and treason very seriously. In fact, um, there's a reason why the ninth circle of hell in Dante's Inferno is, is reserved for traitors. Um, they take it very seriously, and they're not going to give anybody a pass on this. I don't think we've ever had a Dante's Inferno reference on this week <laughs> in South Florida. That will go down as the first. Um, so, technically, he was not is not charged with <clears throat> espionage, right? He's charged with being an illegal agent for the Cuban it, government. It's a distinction without conspiracy. a difference, ah, okay. uh, because he wasn't caught red-handed. So conspiracy to be an agent of a foreign government, being an agent of a foreign government, 
that's just another way of saying, we know you did it, but we just didn't catch you red-handed. And that's why you add on the other 13 charges uh, that will buttress what you believe happened. So you, you know him, you met him, you were on assignment mm -hmm. in Mexico with Correct. him way back when. Um, he was just this perfect s demographic of Miami, Republican, wealthy businessman who had been in public service. So his arrest just kind of bowled everyone over, had everyone rethinking conversations with him. What did sure. I say? What did I, what, from what you know of him, what is an appropriate, we don't know the plea, right? We don't know the terms. What is an appropriate sentence for him and, and in return for what? Listen, if, if, from my perspective, I think that whatever sentence should be inappropriate because, because this is treason. We, we're not going to call it that. We'll, we'll be we'll be nice. We we don't but, know the extent of the damage, <coughs> do we? We don't, and that's going to that'll Probably. be that'll be part of the uh, I guess the uh, damage assessment. But one charge carries a five-year sentence. One charge carries a ten-year sentence. I'm assuming that he will agree to the max fifteen years. Um, Interestingly, both attorneys showed up at the courtroom and said, hey, we got this, and the judge said, just a minute, I'm the judge, I'll figure out if this is, we have this or not. Um, she may be able to add a couple years, maybe she'll take a couple years off just for not having to inconvenience the government through a trial. But the man is 73 years old. A 15-year sentence means if the actual t actuarial tables are, are friendly, he'll be out when he's 88. And there's another aspect of it that I have been researching and that's the fact that, to my knowledge, this is the first high-level, naturalized American citizen to be charged this way. Hmm. So the possibility exists that once he completes his term, he could be denaturalized. He could be stripped of his U.S. citizenship and sent back to Colombia. Why Colombia? That's where he was born. Ah, okay. So not there would be no way to send him to Cuba. That would if they be take it. him, I'm sure. I don't think he'd want to go there, um, but. Wherever it is, he would, he would revert back to the status he had before he applied, which is a Colombian citizen in the United States. Well, what would be, to, to his benefit, why not fight the charge? Because they've got too much evidence. Um, again, the, the idea that the federal government is coming in to discuss how much and what kind of classified information I'm going to produce to convict this guy tells you that they have an abundance of evidence and that you're just not going to win this. How many, uh, just to broaden this out a little bit, you know, such a surprise at his arrest, how many Manuel Rochas do you think might be in South Florida, the United States? Well, in the intelligence world, you really don't know who else is working. For example, I seriously doubt that Manuel Rocha knew that Ana Belen Montes was also spying for Because they're silos. They're, com they're yeah. compartmented. But as part of the damage assessment, they're going to sit him down for months, maybe longer, and he's going to have to walk them through. And if there's any possibility that he's lying or holding back, they can go back to the judge and say, you know what, he's violated the terms of the plea agreement. But that was my next question. How would they know if he's lying? They would ask him things that they already know and see what the response is. So they'll have to know to know if he's lying, but if they don't know, they or, don't know or, what they don't or know. They'll, or they'll have <laughs> ideas or they'll have questions on things that fell through the crack or didn't happen or happened differently, and they suspect that there was an inside, you know, mm -hmm. mole. And, but, but again, he's going to have to start with when he was recruited, who did it, where, why, what his training was, what his, who his contacts were, and then, to your point, who else is out there, if, if in fact he would know um, that kind of detail. So uh, April 12th is the next hearing, and, and your expectation is we will know the terms of the plea then and well, go from there? The expectation is, he, according to what he is pleading to, it's, it's going to be at least 15 years. Mm. But then you get into the details. Where will he serve his sentence? Will he go to a supermax prison, or where, where he goes someplace uh, uh, in, in Tallahassee or in Pensacola? Do you think we'll ever know publicly the contents of the, the documents that they're talking no. about? <laughs> no, that's we never knew Ana Belen Montes' right, um, right. Ass assessment because it's it's just um, you you don't want that out there. You know we we're just fascinated with spy stories here. <laughs>
and <laughs> not nonfiction takes it up a whole new level. <laughs> Emilio Gonzalez, thanks so much, my spy expert. And, and in this case, I mean, you just, you know stuff, and I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. This, this, this is not over. I think this is going to be the gift that keeps on giving locally. <laughs> that seat is yours whenever you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> thanks right. so much. Thank you. Justice delayed is now justice on hold. A stunning turn of events in the child murder case that stunned South Florida. The prosecutor who started the Barahona case 13 years ago is with us live next. A bit of a bombshell this week in a case now 13 years in process. A crime that shook South Florida to the core. Changed laws, upended the state's child welfare system. George Barahona, who with his wife stand accused of the torture of their adopted children and the death of one of them, was ruled incompetent to stand trial. And you may ask, why now? Where's everyone been for 13 years? Where is justice for the little girl who actually should be turning 24 this year? To get some grounding here, we turn to Gay Levine, the original prosecutor on the case, now retired blissfully and keeping tabs <laughs> from outside the system. Great to have you at the table. Thank you for We're having me on today. Zoom. Yeah. It's great to have you here. I get to see you today. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this week, three court ordered psychologists brought in evaluations. Two of them judged George Barahona incompetent. One of them actually judged him competent. Correct. And the judge said incompetent to stand trial, remanded him to DCF custody, what does that mean and how did that go down? Well, it means delay. Another delay. A needless, what seems like a needless de delay to most people. Well, is it, is it, I mean, if he's incompetent on trial, it's fair to judge him that well, way? Well, I guess what's curious is where's the transparency in that? What do you mean by that? Well, the judge could have ordered a hearing and then the reports would have been unsealed. Now they remain sealed. So we don't know why two of them and one of them differed from each other. That's very interesting. Well, it is interesting. And of course, although they are licensed psychologists and hopefully forensic psychologists that the court appoints, we don't know really all their credentials. What did they look at? Did they view him in the jail? Did they talk to correctional officers? Did they make an assessment? that was really a full assessment or did they go in with a plan to thaw? So is it a, a case where, have you been in any of these hearings where you get to cross-examine? Of course. The, uh, why wouldn't that have happened here? I don't have an explanation for that and I guess that's what sort of piqued my interest because like the rest of the public, I'm curious. Would it be a, a possibility that this is a, a death penalty case would it be possi a possibility that the judge just wanted to give the defense every possible benefit of the doubt because in a death penalty case, you know, you don't want to be appealed for whatever reason? Well, first of all, you get appealed if you did something wrong. Second of all, this case has been going on for 13 years. Mm -hmm. What every possible benefit could they have? He's had one set of lawyers for nine years. Those lawyers withdrew. He now has a new set of lawyers that had him, that's had him for two and a half years. And where were these incompetency evaluations? Not only that, Glenna, if he has a mental illness, that is a reason why the state would waive the death penalty. If he had a true mental mm -hmm. illness, mental capacity is something that the state takes very seriously in determining. It's a mitigator. Exactly, in, terminating, in determining whether he's eligible for the death penalty. When I was there, for the years that I prosecuted the case up until 2020, I never saw a psychiatric evaluation. It was never presented to us. So that, you know, there, to your point, there were changes uh, in his attorneys, there were changes in prosec prosecutors. Five judges. Five judges. Um, Carmen, his wife, took a plea. Mm -hmm. There was COVID, you know, that, that was a hiatus. Mm -hmm. um, and so she took a plea for life in return for being a, a witness against him. Why, I guess you asked the question that I was going to ask, why now were competency evaluations done that were never done before? I don't know. I don't have an explanation for that. And frankly, the defense doesn't have to tell you why they didn't do it. But what would have been very good was for the judge to not allow the stipulation of the reports to have it heard so we could have the public know, is he really incompetent? You know, you know what I was... Um, thinking about is he he and Carmen were foster parents 
They were allowed then to adopt, and there were two other children in the house besides Nubia and Victor. Would DCF had, have done any kind of psych evals on potentially foster and adoptive parents? Do we go back that far and see what those psych, eval, uh, psych evals were and why would they have been granted custody of these children? I don't know whether they do full and complete psychological evaluations, but they certainly vet them mm -hmm. and they were vetted. And there was always a question about that DCF didn't vet them properly. I don't know whether that was so. I think they put up a good front and they were given not just Nubia and Victor, but they were given two other severely handicapped children, yeah. mentally handicapped children. So I don't know exactly where the blame is, but I will tell you DCF paid an awful lot of money. Y so, they did, and laws were changed and, in the uh, last 13 years. And there are you know, victims in that case that now sit on a lot of money. Um, DCF custody is now where George Barahona is. What does Ironic, that, isn't it? What does, what does that mean? And where, practically speaking, where will he be? What does that mean? Well, he could go to a various places. He has to go to a facility that's uh, locked, but he will not be held as a prisoner. It's not like he's going to be walked like he is now with handcuffs. He's going to walk freely in the facility that allows him to walk freely. So he will have an opportunity to get medications. The goal is for him to compensate. The goal is for him to get back to trial as fast as possible. And the judge can order a review in 60 days from the date of him being incompetent to see how he's doing. So he, so mental uh, illness or incompetency is a temporary state? It can possibly. be, it can be temporary. I mean, there are people that go to these facilities and fake. Can, you can fake, well, you know, he's been in jail a long time. Well, you learn. A lifetime for some. You learn from your others. Do you think, you know, I, as, a, as a prosecutor, I, I see where you're coming from, but legitimately, I mean, could somebody fake a psychological evaluation? And if so, wouldn't the psychologist know that? Not all the psychologists know it. Some people find it to be not faking. I have had many a hearing where we call it malingering, not faking, but we call it malingering, where I've had psychologists say the person was not malingering, and some psychologists say that the person was malingering, and the judge would make a determination. The state, I think, had an obligation to bring this forward, to not stipulate to the reports. The state could go to the evaluation, could see the evaluations, ask for the evaluations to be videotaped. There's lots of things that we could know, and transparency is so important in the criminal justice system. I think this latest twist has frustrated so many people, including you. I can see that, and uh, you know, it's not over yet. No, it's not over yet. Gail and cases don't get better with age. Go back to retirement. Have a great day. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, um, I so appreciate your insights and, and coming here and helping us out with that. No problem. All right. All right, we will be right back. Stay tuned. Rewatch today's interviews or listen to the This Week in South Florida podcast. All you have to do is scan that QR code right there with your phone and it takes you right to the This Week in South Florida section of local10.com. You know we love to hear your input on anything we've talked about today, really anything in the news, and you can connect really easily on social media at Glenna WPLG. That's on X, Twitter, and Instagram, and Facebook. We thank you so much for spending this hour with us. Have a beautiful Sunday, and remember, keep in touch.